Hey guys, Jim here. Time for another new acquisition video and something that's rather out of character for me. Uh, I'm going to be showing you tonight the Matt Diskin Fire. Now, this is an incredible knife. And what I say about it being out of character, you know, I've been really leaning toward really heavily modified knives, customs, hand-built customs, more exotic stuff lately, and not really looking back. Even with the mid-techs that I've owned and I still own that I love and that I enjoy, I've really been, you know, kind of gearing my collection uh, onward and upward, as they say. And then a friend of mine decided to list this knife on Instagram for sale last week. And I said, you know what, damn it, I've looked at these things a million times on dealers' websites like Fort Henry and Blade HQ. And I've just not pulled the trigger on them. There was always been something that just, I don't know what it was. Maybe it wasn't flashy enough, wasn't fancy enough. And it's, it's not that... You know, everything that I want has to be flashy or fancy. I mean, God knows, you know, guys, I love my whole backs and things like that. But I don't know. It just didn't seem visually like it was really going to spark a lot of my interest. Then I got a chance to meet Matt Diskin at the uh, New York Custom Knife Show last November. He had a few of his knives out there, so I got to handle it and play with it. And I was really impressed, and he was a really super guy. But, you know, I was off, you know, chasing grails and things like that during the show. And when Jack put this up for sale the other day, I said, you know what? Screw it. Not only do I just need to just go ahead and buy one of these just for myself, but this was a special edition that was made in a custom configuration for Ford Henry Knives for Vince. And the I thought the combination on it, the colors, the coatings, the anodization was just striking. So without any further ado, let me get into it. First off, you're going to get a really, really high grade leather pouch for your packaging. I mean, even when you smell it, I mean, you can just tell this is really, really nice, high-quality leather. And inside will be this incredible knife. Now, what really jumped out at me about this particular variation was, like I said, the, the way that this one was treated. So on this variation, you're getting into very, very dark stonewashed frames. The scales are done in lightning strike carbon fiber with a really, really nice texture. The thumb stud and the hardware is a uh, specially anodized just for Vince. And it's, it's, it's weird. It almost looks like uh, brass or even copper. And when you look at it from a little bit of a distance and in the right light, it looks like rose gold. I've had a lot of bronzed anodized things, you know, hardware or even full scales. And they don't come out looking like this. It's almost a rose gold. Then, of course, the backspacer is also done in lightning strike carbon fiber. So I thought the look of it was just gorgeous. And when you get it open, you see the black DLC blade. But you can actually see, and I don't know, I'm sure my camera will pick it up. There, You can actually see the stone wash in the steel as well. And the steel happens to be LMAX, which is one of my favorite blade steels, when done right, when done by a custom maker. The action on it is fantastic. And I really have to do a lot of comparisons here between this knife and a Chris Reeves Sebenza. As I feel it has the same practical EDC applications. It can be a good user knife. It's slim and lightweight enough to carry every single day, no matter how you're dressed. The ergonomics are great. There's nothing on this knife that's particularly stand out where you go, holy shit, wow, I have to own it. But it's when you hold it and when you're playing with it that you just realize how amazing this knife really is. Now, the other thing that makes it amazing is this is a hidden scale release dual action. So as you saw, I can simply open it very easily with the thumb studs, which actually act as the blade stops as well. But also, when you slide this scale upwards, it's an automatic. And it's a completely hidden away automatic for those of you that want to have the freedom to carry an automatic. Maybe you're in a state or province that doesn't allow that. You know, I'm not saying you should try to shirk the law, but what I'm saying is, I don't know, shit happens, and that particular day you happen to get pulled over, and the officer asks you about weapons in the vehicle, and you hand him your folding knife. 
There are certain knives that when it's an automatic, you're just going to know it's an automatic. And this, if he just goes like this, well, okay, well, this is obviously a standard gentleman's folder. So I don't have anything to worry about. What he doesn't know is that by simply pivoting that scale up, it's actually an automatic. Let me show you the, the movement of the scale right there so you get an idea of how much movement there is. And it's actually working on a central pivot. Just beautifully done. I just got, I got to tell you, the, the thought and the details that went into this are incredible. Now, I had the chance to speak with Matt on the phone this evening about 20 minutes before I started doing this video. And he gave me some, you know, good information, but it wasn't anything, you know, that I didn't already kind of know about it. But some of the important things I want to point out to you is, you know, how you can order one, where you can get one, what you can expect for the future, that sort of thing. So let's talk about the knife in general. First off, you're looking at uh, overall length of 8 inches open with a blade length of 3 and 5 eighths of an inch. So, again, it's not a really big knife. And to give you some size comparisons, I'll bring out a handful full of my favorites here. If I don't drop them all on the floor, holy shit. You guys know this is one of my top favorites, my Brad Southerd Custom, my Tarsus. So it's, a li it's a only a little bit bigger than the Tarsus, and that hopefully starts to give you an idea that, wow, this really isn't a giant monster knife. Uh, Kirby Lambert, Orion MGT. And as you see, I'm putting everything butt to butt, as all things in the world should be. Now you're starting to get a little bit of a better sense. It's almost, almost the same size. Uh, my Rockstead Sheen, don't put your fingers near that blade, butt to butt. The Rockstead Sheen is a three and a half inch, but it has a shorter handle length on it than you would expect typically, and he's using a longer handle here. So there's some quick basic comparisons for you to knives that you've seen on my channel many, many times before. All right, so you're looking at LMAX steel, so you know you're going to get a fantastic cutting edge, and that cutting edge is going to last a very long time. This particular knife is extremely, extremely sharp. I did play with it just a little bit a couple hours ago. You can just slice in paper and shit, just, oh, what kind of edge does it have? And it just would, would just glide right through the paper. You did a great, great job on that. Uh, you have textured LVA. Uh, I'm sorry, that would be on the regular carbon fiber. Um, this is textured lightning strike carbon fiber. I'll give you a nice close-up look on that. And he's actually doing a CNC contouring on these scales. So all this stuff is done by machine. And it's very, very precise. It looks good. And what I love about it is it gives you an extra bit of tactility. So you've got a little, I mean, it's not overly grippy. It's certainly not going to tear up your fingers or the pockets on your pants or anything. But there's just enough there that you've got a little bit more tactility. And that's really important for using the scale to release the automatic uh, because you, you don't want your thumb just sliding right across it. So you've got just enough grip so you don't have to squeeze down on it like you're trying to kill it. And you're able to get that bad boy open. So what you're looking at basically is it's hard to categorize and even Matt had a hard time really categorizing it um, I said you know it's I know it's not a custom you know it looks and it feels and it's got the quality of a custom but you know would you really consider this to be a mid-tech or a production and he tends to prefer the term mid-tech for it and he agrees the same way that I've, I've mentioned in the past that, you know, that term has become very muddy uh, over the past couple of years. So it's really hard to tell what mid-tech really means. But what he's doing is he is CNCing the blade and then everything on the knife is done in his shop in-house. So he's not farming anything else out. So that's important to mention there. Everything is hand fitted. Everything is done in his shop. Obviously, the final edge on the blade will be done in his shop as well. So I think uh, mid tech is a perfectly uh, acceptable term for this. But I did want to make sure I talked to him about it specifically because God forbid, you know, I see some of the comments you guys make. A couple of you guys are yahoos, and you know it. But I love you guys. Um, you know, if I said this is a mid tech or it's a production, it, it, people are just going to start arguing back and forth amongst themselves. So I wanted to get it straight from the proverbial horse's mouth. 
The basic operation, if you've never handled a dual action automatic, and you can go back in my channel to whoosh year and a half or so ago when I was discussing various types of automatic knives. And one of the knives I had was a ProTech that was a collaboration with Jeff Harkins. Jeff Harkins is probably my favorite maker of automatic knives. And that was also a dual action. The scale on that, there were section carbon fiber scales that were inlaid instead of being uh, overlays. They were inlaid into the aluminum frame. And you would press on the front, on the top side, because you had a scale here and a little scale here. And you would press on the smaller scale and it would pivot this way inside of the frame to release it. And this one you're just simply sliding it upwards uh, to release the blade. So what it's doing here, and I... There we go, there's enough light. You see back here, you see part of the lightning strike carbon fiber backspacer. Now that does run the entire spine of the frame for two reasons. One, it gives some obvious great rigidity between the frames. Um, it's also going to be for basic protection. It's going to A, cover up that giant leaf spring that's in there so you don't see that unsightly thing. But it's also there, Matt says, he goes, just on the off chance something were to ever go wrong and a, a leaf spring were to break or snap while it's being deployed, it's not going to shoot out you know, into the user's hand. So you've got this uh, lightning strike carbon fiber plate to protect you. Now what you see in there is going to be your leaf spring. It's a very, very, very strong spring. Now this is not the hardest firing automatic I've ever handled, but it certainly is up there with some of the best. It's not enough so that when you fire it, it wants to uh, torque out of your hand, but you definitely feel it jump. And you'll see the lock up here is solid, great lock up. He's using a stainless lock bar insert here to mate up with the LMAX steel. So you don't really have to worry too much about uh, the titanium wearing up against the steel. Did some great contouring all the way around. It's actually a very comfortable knife. Uh, all the edges here were chamfered all the way around. And then he's done the further contouring here for your comfort. You'll also notice that the lock bar insert sticks out a little bit. I actually like this because now if you have your locking area the same height as the rest of the knife, sometimes it's hard to get into. So now all you got to do is just slide your thumb across and it naturally wants to engage on that lock. Now one of the things people tend to fear with a uh, dual action is, well, what if I've manually opened my blade and I somehow hit that deployment? Is it going to break it? With this knife, no, you're not going to have that issue. With other knives, it's not something I'd really want to try. Uh, but you don't have that concern here. That's something that I actually learned from our good friend Mike, who goes by Terra Fanatic. If you're not subscribed to his YouTube channel, you should. And uh, he was another one of those guys that got his hands on these and uh, told the world, you've got to have one. You've got a deep carry pocket clip, which you guys know I frown upon that strongly. I despise them for everything that they stand for. Uh, but I'm going to have to just look past it on this knife because I love everything about the knife. I'm just going to have to deal with the fact that it's going to be a little bit harder to, to retrieve the knife out of the pocket. But, you know, maybe I'll just throw a lanyard on here and, and not have to worry about it. I wish it had a lanyard hole. That's um, the one and only knock on this knife is I, I don't have a way to really truly attach a lanyard properly on it. So I like being able to, to have that option. Now again, this isn't really meant to be a tactical knife, so I can uh, forgive it that transgression. Some of the details on this that I absolutely love. Let's take a look here at the thumb stud slash blade stop. We can get it to focus. Come on. There we go. This is not your average everyday thumb stud. Look at the amount of work and thought and detail that's gone into this. That's just gorgeous, man. That is absolutely gorgeous. And the same thing for the pivot. Um, I kind of talk it, I kind of call it the um, the circus big top pivot, because it reminds me of that big top tent. If you look at it from the top, all the faceting that's been done on it, and I'm sure that's not the uh, <laughs> the fanciest name for it, but that's what I see. When I look at that, I see a circus big top, and there's nothing wrong with that. Here is the other side of the pivot, also nicely done around the outer edges. Quick, easy adjustment with the torques. 
There is the other side of your thumb stud. All of these little details, these are the kind of things that you would find in a custom made knife. You've got the custom hardware holding the overlays onto the frame. The way the overlays are done very nicely complements the, uh, the shape and overall design and theme of the knife. Love this dark stone wash throughout the frames. Now let's talk about the real reasons I love this knife. This is something very much along the lines of a Sebenza. There's not a single day that goes by that if that's in my pocket, that I'm going to feel like I'm lacking. I don't care what I'm doing. If I want to show off to my friends, well, I got that cool dual action, hidden sliding scale thing going on. So there's definitely got some wow factor to it. It's slim, so there's no excuse to ever leave the house without carrying something. It's lightweight, rides nicely in the pocket. The ergonomics, it, it's just a wonderful feel. I actually kind of look at this as a cross between a William Henry and a Sebenza. There's a little bit of William Henry in the, the overall flow of the knife. You know, because it doesn't look anything like a Sebenza, but it has the uh, utilitarian kind of design that a Sebenza has. You've got a couple of different ways of using it. You've got a nice forward choil here. It's a smaller choil. You're not going to really, if you've got somewhat fat fingers, you kind of see how my finger wants to engage the, uh, the blade there. He does block this off. That's very important to note. So if you do have fatter fingers, you're probably not going to cut yourself. He blocks this off nicely. So, you know, but if you got really big fat fingers, the choil may not be all that useful for you. If you want to pull back a little bit and just index it, you know, and then you can still do your nice fine cutting task. You've got a little bit more forward control on it instead of, you know, holding it back here. You've got a little bit more precision in your cutting here. It's got a nice profile to the blade, just enough belly to get the job done. Nice spiky pointy tip. It's a blade that whether you're going to use it to cut your steak or... Um, gut open a fish, or if you're going to whittle away some wood, you're going to cut it down some cardboard, open some boxes. There's not many tasks I can think of in your everyday life that this wouldn't be suited for. You could take this out as a backup knife when you're out camping. Obviously, you're going to have your big fixed blade and, and stuff like that, and your, your little hatchet and little shit like that. But this is going to be a great little backup piece to carry for that purpose as well. Everything about it was just well thought out. It's solid enough blade stock but they didn't go ridiculous, crazy, overly thick. There's nothing massive or overbuilt, yet it feels solid. There's nothing that feels cheap or loose or rickety about this knife. Now, this version was a little bit more expensive because, uh, A, it was not bought at the show uh, where Matt was, and B, it was a special edition made for Fort Henry Custom Knives. But if you go to him at a show, you're going to pay in that, I think it's around $4.75 to get your hands on it. Holy shit, man. I mean, this is a powerhouse of value at $4.75. Even at what I paid. I paid $600 for this. I have no problem admitting that. Uh, again, it was a special edition. They were more expensive when they were brand new uh, at the fort. And I have no problem paying a little bit extra for the embellishments that are on here that really, to my eye, and you might prefer the standard versions, and they're great, but to my eye, this was more special. This spoke to me. It called out to me. It said, Jim, oh, Jim, come here, touch me, hold me, feel me in your hands. Yes, well, sometimes it can be like a romantic relationship, that intimacy that you have with your, uh, with your knife collection. There's no shame in that. There is no shame in this room. Who remembers that quote? I bet you don't. All right. So is it worth the money? Oh, shit, yeah. Should you own one? I'm going to tell you right now. I love being able to do this because a lot of times I bring out stuff that's not available or the custom maker's books are full for three, four, five years. I'm really happy to come out here with a knife that I truly, in every conceivable way, am madly, uncontrollably in love with that you can actually freaking buy. 
He's going to be at the Blade Show. He doesn't take orders. I want to be very clear. He does not take orders. But if you see him at any of the knife shows, he always brings plenty. You can buy direct and at the best prices. You can order uh, through two dealers that I know of that he supplies on a regular basis. FortHenryCustomKnives.com and BladeHQ.com. Both I've dealt with. Both are phenomenal websites. Great people that run them. Uh, Vince over at Blade HQ. I'm sorry, over at uh, Fort Henry Custom Knives. I know Jake over at Blade HQ. He's a phenomenal dude. So you're dealing with great customer service, great dealers, and you're going to get a knife. I'm going to tell you this right now. It's going to blow you away in a way that you're not expecting. Because again, you look at it and go, oh yeah, that's a nice looking knife. But when I compare it to this knife and that knife and that knife, well, I just don't know. You know, it was a lot of the same feelings that I had when I was considering buying my Rockstead shin. And I hemmed and hawed for months on these because of their pricing. I mean, $1,300 for a knife that's not a hand-built custom, well, that's tough. Well, I did my research, and then once, once I learned about how it was made, I had to have it. But once I held it in my hands, that was it. And this is a knife that I will never give up. You know, this has been in my collection a very long time. This is another one of those knives that once you've handled it, there is no denying how fantastic it really is. Great balance, great aesthetics, beautiful finish work, great steel, great blade, nice clean action if you're just flicking it open or slowly thumbing it open or firing it open as an automatic, whichever way you want to do it. This is going to be one of the most wholly satisfying knives that you're going to buy. And please take my word on that. So if you can find one in stock and you maybe you're thinking, well, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, just friggin' do it, man. I'm serious. Do it. It's going to be one of those knives that it's, it's maybe it's just an afterthought. You're heading out the door. You just reach in your case. You're just going to grab anything that pops into your hand. And if it's this one, every time you reach for it, you're going to go, damn really fucking love this knife. And you guys know it takes a lot to impress me. I try to only showcase knives here that I love. Doesn't always work out that way. But this is one I'm very glad that I ponied up the money for. So if you can find one, definitely grab it. Check him out at uh, the Blade Show if you're going. He's going to be introducing a new flipper. He's going to be introducing fires that have a two-tone compound grind blade. Oh, ho, ho. I already told him I'm going to be buying one of those, and I will be. So you'll be seeing another one in my collection for future videos. All right, folks, I'm out of here for now, and I will see you on the next video.